Hi, I'm Cameron Brick. Today's lecture is about personality, intelligence, and pro-social behavior. How do we differ from other people? How do we measure those differences reliably? And how do these differences matter for our health, our relationships, our financial outcomes, and the environment? Let's start with the definition. Personality refers to individual differences of patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. So this is a very broad word in psychology. You can see it has cognition, it has emotion, uh, it has expressions of the individual in space, you know, behavior. And it, it's broad and that has strengths and weaknesses as you'll see. I, the, today's lecture is pretty complex, so I set out some learning goals for you to be able to touch in with whether you're getting out of the lecture what we are intending you to. And some of these are about uh, being able to describe and paraphrase information, and some of these require a little bit um, more uh, involvement from you about methods. Uh, but if you track the lecture as it goes, I think these will come to you, take some notes, and we will also return to these at the end of the lecture. Okay, I want to highlight four dangers right here up front. And they're dangerous because most people are very confident that they know what types of people other people are, their personalities. For example, who's extroverted and who's not. And there's four problems, and I just want to begin with them. Let's call the first one confirmation bias. Let's say that we have a goal to understand whether Sonder is a jerk. The point is that context and goals determine what kind of search we execute, and what kind of search we execute determines to some extent what answer we find. And so it's not independent of the target and their behavior, which uh, it would be in a more objective process. So let's say that we were an opponent of Saunders and we were motivated to find any evidence that he were a jerk. Then we look at his behavior and we look for evidence that he was a jerk and everyone's a jerk sometimes. We find it and we say, could he be a jerk? Yes, here's evidence. So we're more likely to conclude even if, if there's limited evidence. Now, if we had no particular stake, if we were neutral, maybe we ask a question like, is he a jerk? But if we were a friend of Saunders and we were trying to find evidence that would make them look better, and this can be unconscious, this can be without uh, any deliberate intentions, we might be asking a different question, something like, must he be a jerk? And then you find a bunch of evidence and you find some evidence he's a jerk, but it's, you, know, you also find some evidence that he was good to people when he didn't need to be, and so you conclude overall he's not a jerk. The second of the major dangers, let's call it limited information. We form impressions very quickly uh, with little evidence. But as a psychologist, I might observe people's behavior varies a lot between contexts. So if you observe them uh, at school, that doesn't mean that's how they behave at home with their family. Behavior is probabilistic, which means that it uh, isn't dichotomous, you know, always aggressive, always um, kind. It, and it emerges as the result of many, many causes, some contextual. And, uh, and we often make judgments about people without even having met them. We, we hear about them from others, or we've met them once, but we're basing our judgment on other things. And so there's a limited information problem. A third problem is that we overlook the need for a comparison group. We often forget that inferring associations such as X causes Y requires a comparison or a standard. So this is a tricky one, so let's spend a minute on it. Let's say I have the question, does uh, eating chicken soup when you are sick make you feel better? If you go back to my childhood, I would have absolutely said yes to this. Uh, it was very comfort food for me. And it might be intuitive to imagine that we can answer this question just by looking at people who have eaten chicken soup when they were sick and then reported whether they felt better, like me. So I might say, you know, I had chicken soup most of the times 
uh, all the times I was sick and, and, it, uh, and I felt better most of those times. And so you count had chicken soup, yes, and then feel better or feel same, and then you have a sense of whether it improved things. This is intuitive, but it is actually false uh, because you need the other column to be able to conclude that chicken soup did anything. The other column is people who didn't have chicken soup and who felt better or felt the same or worse. And in this case, we've, we've tabulated it such that the uh, columns are the same, which means that there's no effect of chicken soup. There's one other design here, design issue about concluding whether chicken soup causes uh, feeling better. Do you know what it is? It's the causal inference of assuming that the treatment is causing the outcome. Was chicken soup randomly assigned? Did people enter a study and then the researchers sent out chicken soup? No. People are just having chicken soup and then some of them are feeling better. And without that randomly assigned experiment, it's very difficult to conclude that it's the soup that's doing it. It could be, you know, households that have more resources uh, are more likely to buy chicken soup and those people are healthy for other reasons because they have better access to health care or something like that. Well done if you pick that up. An application to our the pandemic situation is that we might compare, uh, you know, different infection rates between countries and then look at mask wearing and say, OK, South Korea did really well in the first few months and they wear masks. Therefore, wearing masks causes dot dot dot. But the mask wearing was not randomly assigned. So it might be uh, it, it's it's vulnerable to a third variable explanation. OK. The fourth of the four dangers is called the pleasant truth problem. We tend to believe an idea is true if the idea makes us feel good. And this is related to the just world hypothesis that you might have seen in my sustainability work. So how do these ideas feel to you, just intuitively? The first one is hard work and willpower are less important in educational outcomes than family wealth. Next, as a parent, how you raise your children plays little role in whether your children grow up to become criminals or law-abiding citizens. Our important behaviors are mostly the result of intentional, conscious thoughts. And finally, our thoughts, emotions, personality, and sense of self can be changed through drugs or physical changes to the brain. I'm not gonna argue these are all 100% true, but I think there's actually quite a lot of evidence for these, and, uh, and yet we intuitively find them very difficult to accept. And personality is one of these areas where people have existing opinions, and it makes it more difficult to evaluate the, the evidence that we find. So we have reality, let's say, in two columns. You know, some things are false and some are true. And then on the other side, we have things that feel good or feel bad, and we can break that into four quadrants. What I want to observe here is that we mostly tend to believe this row. Fictions that make us feel good and truths that make us feel good. But reality is over here. And so we have a partial overlap, uh, but there's specifically things that are contrary to our values or contrary to what makes us feel safe are more difficult to accept. So let's do a little mini review. You can look at your notes and see whether what you've written down uh, allows you to reconstruct the main four components that we've looked at so far. And if not, you can consider how your note taking is working for you or not. Okay, so the big difference between a sort of intuitive anecdotal approach to personality and a robust healthy science is self-correction. You can see here at the top, we have a theory about how something works, then we generate predictions, then we test those predictions. And the generating prediction stage is necessary because if you just observe a ton of things and then you look for relationships, you can find all kinds of spurious relationships. So the, the predictions allow you to narrow down into uh, uh, controllable, reasonable space where inferences make more sense. Then you do confirmatory testing. 
you know, comparing the observations with the theory and then updating your theory and, and having new theory again at the top. The number one warning sign of a belief system about the world that is not high quality is that there's that doesn't incorporate this correction process. For example, in astrology, there's no way to uh, update the theory of what sign you are, for example, based on observations. Okay, so there's a lot of evidence for personality, and I'll, we'll go into different types in a bit. But right now, just broadly speaking, personality is set. Um, that is to say, we have significant traits, and they're consistent over time. And they're set pretty early. They seem to be before we develop our complicated um, psychology components like attitudes, values, beliefs, which groups we think about being part of, etc. And personality is fairly stable across the lifespan. I'll present more and more evidence for this later, but I'll just assert right now, uh, personality can predict health outcomes, social status, income, relationship quality, lots of things that we care about. And that makes it worth studying. So let's talk about health in this little mini section of how personality could drive an important outcome that we all care about. And we'll talk about it in three parts. The first two, and then a very quick third one. Okay, so on a piece of paper, please write down 10 numbers, and then I'm gonna ask you to make check marks. I'll pa just pause the lecture now and you can write these down. Okay, so pause. Okay, you're back. Now, you can make a check next to each of these items that you currently feel. So pause the lecture again now and check next to each item. Okay, you're back. And you have a certain number of checks. Okay, we'll come back to that. A type A personality was something that was very famous, uh, you know, about 50 years ago. And it, it was famous you know, because it was linked to heart disease. And heart disease is the number one killer in the developed world. Um, you know, more than cancer, more than smoking, more than anything else. Okay, so type A personality is characterized by sense of time urgency, needing to be somewhere right now, have something done, competitiveness and ambitiousness, and hostility and aggression. So type A's eat too fast, they're very active or maybe too active, they set deadlines for themselves, they get irritated, and they play to win, even silly little party games. So when psychologists are, were, were trying to classify people as type A or not, they used to use something called the structured interview for type A personality. And a trained interviewer would pay attention not just to the person's words, but also to their style of interaction. So let me give you an example of how the response is important. I could ask one of you, how would your friends rate your general level of activity? And then you would answer, and then I would say, okay, most people who work or go to school have to get up fairly early in the morning. In your particular case, uh, what time do you um, ordinarily, um, and type A people would jump in and say whatever o'clock when you're hesitating. They don't want to wait for the end of the sentence. Some of the early strong evidence that this mattered was from a, uh, a prospective cross, you know, cross-sectional design. So it is, it's not a causal experiment in that they haven't manipulated whether people have type A personality, but it's a high quality correlational design because you assess personality and follow people over time, which makes it harder. It well, it makes it harder to have the problem that it might have been reverse causality. Okay, type A men were twice as likely to get heart disease, twice as likely to die of heart disease, and those are pretty strong effects. However, no one does research on type A anymore, and perhaps you've not even heard of it, I'm not sure. So why is that? Let me play you a short video by Dr. Robert Sapolsky, and he will explain to you why.
Type A was first described in the 1950s here in San Francisco. Cardiologists, Meyer, Friedman, Friedman and Rosenman, and here was their original formulation. Time pressured, hostile, impatient, low self-esteem, joyless striving, okay, like 80% of us. And what these guys reported was, if this is what you're like, you are more at risk for heart disease. Cardiologists hated these guys. You're some 1950s Ozzie and Harriet cardiologist, and all you're thinking about is heart valves, and here's these guys instead saying, no, you gotta sit down your patient and talk with, talk with Christ. Who wants to talk to their patients? And say, okay, so you're in the supermarket, and you've picked the line that's going the slowest. You go out of your mind. That has something to do with heart disease. Huge resistance in the field, and it took decades to become absolutely clear from all the meta-analyses, type A is for real, big time. If you have a type A profile, you are <coughs> more at risk for, you are more at risk than if you smoke, than if you have elevated cholesterol levels, than if you are overweight. In terms of heart disease, it's a huge risk factor. And one of the things that's emerged in this field in recent years is a recognition of one of the key components of the type A profile, something that is now referred to as toxic hostility. And this is this attributional style where anything that happens in the world around you is proof that they're out to get you, they're out to get you preferentially, and the only way to protect yourself is have the knives out 24-7. This is, you know, you pick the wrong line in the supermarket, and you want to kill the son of a bitch, get behind the cash register, come on, come on, I have a one o'clock appointment, no, don't ask her how she is today, come on, come on, come on. If this is what you're doing, if this is what you're doing, instead of checking out the Elvis sightings in the National Enquirer, your <laughs> blood pressure is going to go up. And if this is what you're doing every time somebody could have held the elevator door open for you, but didn't, you are going to cumulatively damage this system. And in lots of ways, the central question in this field now is insofar as you have this toxic hostility, what's worse for your heart, expressing the hostility or keeping it repressed inside? What's clear is expressing it is worse for everybody else's blood vessels there, but what is the cost of repressing strong physiological uh, sort of emotions? Okay, so that's stress and heart disease. Actually, one might wonder, how is it that these guys ever figured out about type A personality? How did they discover this? And I got to hear this story some years ago from the horse's mouth himself. Meyer Friedman, in cardiology, he first described it. Died a few years ago in his 90s and was seeing patients up until the end. And as he used to say, I'm still type A, but I'm a type A tortoise now. And here was the story he would tell about the discovery of type A personality. Okay, 1950s, he and his partner had this cardiology practice, San Francisco, everything was fine. There was this one weird problem they were having, which was they were spending a fortune having to reupholster the armchairs in the waiting room. What is this about? Who knows? It's just part of the overhead. Every month the upholsterer comes in, a chair or two to fix. One month the upholsterer is on vacation, replacement upholsterer comes in, takes one look at the chairs and discovers type A personality. Says, what is wrong with your patients? Nobody wears out chairs this way. And this is what it looked like. What you see is the front two inches of the seat, the front two inches of the armrest are torn to shreds like Beavers are in there, dwarf beavers all night going on there. What is this? This is what a type A individual looks like when they are not just figuratively, but literally clawing at the arms of their chair there. This is them squishing and moving around. This is what an individual with a type A profile looks like when they're sitting in their cardiologist's office waiting for getting a result. This is exactly what it looks like. Okay, so what's supposed to happen at that point if science is working correctly? Like, Friedman should grab him, like, good God, man, what you've discovered, or like midnight conferences between upholsterers and cardiologists, or, <laughs> or teams, teams of idealistic young upholsterers sweeping across America and coming back with the news that, no, you don't find chairs like these in podiatrists' offices. That's what should have happened. 
What actually happens, here's where Dr. Friedman starts looking all sheepish, and he says, I told my nurse, get this man out of my face. I'm this important doctor. He's wasting my time. Give him his damn check. He was too type A to listen to the guy. And it was years before he collaborated with a psychologist and out popped this profile, and he said, oh my God, the upholsterer was right to this day. Nobody knows who that guy was. <laughs> Let's see, it's early afternoon. I am willing to bet there in some bar in the marina or something right now, there's some 95-year-old retired upholsterer who's just <laughs> drinking away there, and you get him started, and he's going to go on and on about how he discovered type A personality. <laughs> Absolutely true. So one, one of those dark moments in the history of science. Speaker. I think he's very engaging. He has a great book called um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and you can find some chapters online, so I, I totally recommend that. He's a neuroendocrinologist, and uh, he did a lot of field work in Africa. Very interesting guy. So the reason people don't study type A anymore is because the component that drove all the health outcomes was hostility, so you can just study hostility directly. And it's interesting because hostility doesn't just create a sort of a blood pressure problem like he mentioned. It also affects your context. So someone who is experiencing a lot of drama in their life or who's experiencing that other people are mean to them and then it becomes mean as a result fosters that exact environment. So specifically, when you're hostile to people, they reduce their social support of you and they have more conflict with you. That is a stressful environment, and that can also cause hostility. So it is a vicious cycle. If you think back to earlier in the lecture, I asked you to check off how many uh, you know, marks on a page. Look at these items in red and add up how many check marks you have for the red items. You can pause if you need more time. Okay, so that number. Now, subtract away how many of the black words you checked. Pause if you need time. So this is a measure of your current hostility, and plus five is the most hostile you possible. You marked every red word and none of the black words. Just to give you a sense of uh, your current state, Hostility uh, is dangerous for health, and it's most associated with cardio outcomes. The good news is there are techniques that you can use to reduce hostility. It doesn't have to be a response that your body is doing all the time. One of them that I like is progressive muscle relaxation, and you can Google that for more. Another is self-talk, which is repeating calming statements to yourself. Um, and I do find that helpful because when I'm angry, I get into a, a sort of a loop where I feel like I'm defending to myself how unreasonable the other person's behavior is. But if you can repeat some phrase to yourself that gets you out of that game, or at least gets you realizing that that's the game that you're playing, that can be helpful. And there's a more involved thing called cognitive reappraisal training, which you can also look into. These aren't exam content uh, for this class, but uh, I do just want to give them to students as tools that you can use uh, if you're concerned about hostility. So one way, you know, for example, if you're preparing for a conflict, you can say to yourself, this could be a rough situation, but I know how to deal with it. I can work on a plan to handle this. Easy does it. Stick to the issues and don't take things personally. Or something like uh, you could say to yourself, oh, my muscles are getting tight. I can relax and slow things down and take a breath. I'm angry and that's a signal of what's important to me. So let's sit down and try and solve the problem. So we've talked about links between hostility and health. Another uh, psychological level variable that it can influence health is optimism. And it does so on a different route. This isn't a physiological uh, reactance that affects your blood pressure. Instead, 
When you believe that you will generally experience good outcomes, you tend to do more health promoting behaviors like eating well and exercising, sleeping consistently and enough, engage in fewer risky behaviors, less distressed when you have physical symptoms, that is, you could be just as sick as someone else, but it just doesn't bother you as much, and use more effective coping techniques like the ones that I explained on the last slide. So this is nice. This is a little bit easier to like. Um, if you think about those columns and rows about things that we like or not that are scientific results, because optimism can be practiced. And Tracy Mann did a really cool study uh, showing that that was true. You can look that up as well. So another mini review for you. Pause a moment, take a look at your notes. Can you fill in one trait that predicts disease? One trait that affects responses to many different illnesses? Those look like this, you know, hostility leads to what kind of body change leads to what health outcome? Uh, you can fill those in and the same for optimism. And the bonus, I, I promised you a third section and it is this fast, there is no relationship between personality and cancer. And I can say that confidently because there was for a long time the strong idea or assumption that people were manifesting cancer through negative thinking, anger, fear, anxiety, etc. And there were whole treatments around this, um, but high quality, large scale data clearly shows no relationship with cancer. Okay, so let's move on from the health focused subsection of the lecture, and let's talk about constructs and measurement. Have you ever taken the Myers-Briggs personality inventory? We'll wait on that for a second. I'm going to return to the inventory. And I like in person with classes to do this technique called think pair share where we're only going to have the first component right now with this remote. You can also find um, you know, pause the lecture and find a roommate or call a friend and ask them. And it can be useful to sort of engage with what you think right now, because then when I tell you what the science uh, suggests, you can compare against them. Whereas if you just go straight to the science, then there's often this feeling of intuitive. Yes, of course. And I always thought that even though we might not have. Okay. So the question is, imagine you find a personality test online. How would you know whether it was high quality? Please pause and just think or talk to someone for a little bit. And welcome back. So good personality measures are reliable and re reliability is that the results are stable and consistent. So two key kinds of reliability test retest means you take the test today and then you take the test a month from now and your results are similar. And if it's on something like optimism, we might expect that to be consistent over time. If it changed every day, then what is even being measured? And so that is a problem of reliability. The second one here, interrater reliability, is that different observers should have some relationship to each other and what they're seeing. So if you had a video you know, of you talking for a few hours or interacting at a party or something, and you showed it to different observers and they all independently rated your personality, the ratings should have something to do with each other. And you could do this with people you know as well. And the best quality personality work now combines self-reports with reports by close others like partners, family, and friends. Because it's our parents and our friends actually do know us in some ways that we don't know ourselves because we have certain blind spots and motivations. And the same is true of our understanding of ourselves. We have some insight that they don't have, um, but, some, but much of the insight is consistent that um, you would find that all the raters agree broadly, you know, does this person um, ha like to have an energetic set of a lot of hobbies or not? The other major thing that high quality tests are is valid, which is that they measure what they're supposed to. And this is different than whether the measurements are stable over time. So I could measure the length of your nose and then, and then say how much you lie as a result of it. And that measure would be highly reliable 
it would have test retest reliability and inter rater reliability, but it wouldn't be valid because it has no relationship with personality or behavior. So one type of validity is called construct validity, which is does it fit with existing theory and evidence? And would it make any sense that the length of your nose would uh, be related to your behavior in terms of genes, in terms of natural selection? Not really. Um, and validity is of particular concern for common personality tests like the Myers-Briggs. And we want to just break that down into two key other tests. Concurrent validity, which is do how does it predict related measures? Like if you had another way to measure extroversion, um, does do the two ratings line up with each other? Are they associated? And predictive validity, does it measure any future outcomes? And if I've measured something about you, let's say the length of your nose, and then it predicts nothing about the rest of your life, then why would we care? Here's an example from the Myers-Briggs personality inventory. The question is, you trust reason rather than feelings, and you get to indicate yes or no. There's a bunch of such questions, and depending on how many of them align, you know, this direction or that direction, you get certain labels. In this case, the yes answer leads to the thinker label, and the no answer leads to the feeler label. So over here on the right, you can see there's four major dimensions, extroversion, sensing, thinking, and judging. And so you can end up with four letters, and you could be an INTJ or something like that. The Myers-Briggs is big business. It is pulling in a ton of money. Lots of people use it worldwide. I just have the um, stats here for the US. Many of the major companies, uh, there's a big list of large companies called the Fortune 100 use it in their employee sort of training and HR work. And it's widely used in the military as well. So this is supposed to be state of the art. However, it was based on ungrounded theories that is not amenable to correction and updating. Um, it was developed by non-scientists and also it being marketed and sold per, for profit should give you pause. There's good evidence, and I'll show you in more detail later, that personality predicts important life outcomes and behaviors. And so that's the concurrent and predictive validity component. But the Myers-Briggs does not predict any of these things. And therefore, something is really wrong. Think back to the four mistakes that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. How do they apply here? First, confirmation bias. The categories like thinker are so vague enough as to apply to anyone. You could say, yeah, sometimes I'm a thinker. Low information. The item measures are dichotomous. You pick yes or no. And then at the end, if you're, you know, 51% thinker, then you get labeled thinker. This is, this is poor because it it, people who are 51% thinker are not the same as people who are 97% thinker. And yet here they get the exact same label. This is a high noise, low signal situation. Then we have base rates and comparisons. How does being a thinker relate to other outcomes we care about? Well, you don't see that data because it's not very good. Last, we should be suspicious of the Myers-Briggs because none of the categories are negative. They're all just equal snowflakes of, uh, of similar beauty. And this is not how the world works. So this is a feel-good theory, and it may have some truth to it, but we can know that it's not complete, at least, because there's nothing negative there. In contrast, one of the most major systems used to explain differences in how people think, feel, and behave. It's called the Big Five. And I skipped the sort of history of development of the Big Five. You can read about it online. This is a very widely studied uh, measure, and it's not the only way you could chop up all the variants. I mean, if you did a factor analysis, you might get five factors, you could get three factors, and people have proposed all kinds of theories, and I have published using uh, one that uses six called the Hexaco. But it, the point isn't how many factors are there, but 
If we have five, then what sorts of other things can we help explain? And the five is pretty good. It's a useful level of explanation. So let's talk about it in more detail. It was developed by uh, by two major approaches, uh, but one of the, one of them was listing adjectives like happy or uh, sociable, a huge amount of, um, of labels from language, and then doing surveys and seeing which labels went with each other. Like uh, you just see, okay, if someone answered yes to happy, or not yes, but you know, five out of seven for happy, then do we know anything about how they answered to sociable? And the data show strong reliability and validity, including across cultures, and interestingly, strong genetic predictors. This is a kind of a concurrent validity that is missing from other uh, more popular theories. Like if this is a fundamental part of how you know people differ and it's a it's a natural difference, not something that we've just made up then we should see some relation to it in the past, like in your genes and in your upbringing, and in the future, like in your life outcomes. Okay, let's watch a video uh, just because it's good to break up and not listen to just me droning on. Someone explaining the big five. For many years, the field of psychology has been trying to understand all those personality traits that make you a unique and special little snowflake. Hi guys, I'm Lacey Green and this is D News. It's called Personality Psychology and it's a booming field of research you're bound to hear about in any human psych class. One of the most well-researched and respected personality models in the field is Costin McRae's Big Five. This model evaluates how strong a person is on five different axes. Let's take a look-see at those traits. Trait number one is openness to experience. This trait describes how open or closed your thinking is. Highly open people are intellectually curious, they love art and science. Open people appreciate emotion, unusual ideas, imagination, adventure, and of course, having new experiences. People with low scores tend to have more traditional interests. They prefer familiarity over doing something new and they don't really like change. Trait number two is conscientiousness. Highly conscientious people are basically those annoying overachievers who are always on top of it. They're disciplined, responsible, and good at planning ahead. A high score on conscientiousness suggests a strong ability to regulate and control your behavior. Low scores tend to be more impulsive and unorganized, you know hot mess status. Trait number three is extroversion. People tend to think of extroversion and introversion as how outgoing you are, but it's actually about how you get your energy. High scores, the extroverts feel recharged and energized by going out and being around people. They like parties and chit chatting. Low scores or introverts feel rejuvenated and energized by spending time alone. They tend to be quieter, lower key, and more deliberate. They go to a party and they have to recover the next day. This is sometimes confused with shyness, but shyness is about comfort socializing. Introversion and extroversion are about the amount of socializing you need to do your best and to feel your best. Trait number four is agreeableness. Highly agreeable people are considerate, friendly, and helpful. They just wish we could all get along, guys. They make sacrifices for others and they assume others are good people. Low scores or highly disagreeable people are suspicious, distant, and uncooperative. They place self-interest above getting along. They don't care as much about other people's well-being, and they're less likely to help you out. Basically, they're assholes. I'm just kidding, but really. And last but not least, trait number five is neuroticism. This trait measures emotional stability. Highly neurotic people are more prone to negative emotions like anxiety, anger, depression. They're easily stressed out, they're reactive, and they're more likely to be frustrated in day-to-day -day life. Low scores are more calm and collected. They don't really sweat the small stuff. They're emotionally stable and balanced. Now for a long time, it was thought that these five traits held true across regions and cultures. We've witnessed them in action across across the world, but recently, researchers found an isolated Bolivian farming community where for the first time, it doesn't seem to apply. For this community, there are only two major traits, socially beneficial behavior and industriousness. This makes an interesting suggestion about personality. If there are less developed areas where personality trends are different, society may play a stronger role in encouraging or discouraging the expression of personality traits than we once thought. Food for your brain. So guys, I'm gonna put a link in the description to take the Big Five personality test if you're interested. And here's a question for you to chew on. What traits do you think are going to be especially common amongst those of you in the D News audience? Share your thoughts down below 
and hit subscribe so you can get some more DNews updates. Point out one thing that she said that is not consistent with the uh, scientific consensus is about extroversion. It's not about getting energy. I don't even know what energy means in this context. Extroversion is characterized by sociability, but it also um, is characterized by an energetic engagement with a variety of hobbies. So someone who really likes knitting could be higher in extroversion as a result of their uh, really vigorous knitting habit. And that broadly you know, highlights a problem, which is that when we talk about psychological constructs that emerge from data, but we use labels that are familiar from common language, like extroversion or thoughtfulness or something, then we run into a problem where we're using our previous knowledge and that can conflict with what is trying to be conveyed uh, through the scientific process. So here's an example item from the Big Five Personality Index, and I do encourage you to take it yourself. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's, it's, it's not marketed, it's for free, which is a good sign. I see myself as someone who makes plans and follows through with them. And then you disagree strongly somewhat, you agree somewhat. Think about which of the five personality traits you just heard about is most associated with this. And indeed, that one was from conscientiousness. And I'm not going to read from the slide. I just wanted to share it with you um, because you might be curious to read in more detail about the kinds of items or uh, sub labels that are called facets uh, that, that uh, comprise these five. So one thing that we know about the Big Five right away that makes it look better than the Myers-Briggs is that scores range continuously from low to high. That is, there's no such thing as a conscientious person. People have, you know, a normal distribution of conscientiousness. Some people are high, some people are low, most people are in the middle. It has good test, retest, and inter-rater reliability, and it has good concurrent validity. So one example is that openness to new experiences is positively associated with left-wing political views. It's not a very strong relationship. It's something like a, you know, a Pearson correlation of 0.1 or 0.15, but that it is consistently there across time and across different samples suggests that there's something in openness that is also the thing that is in left-wing politics without needing to say which one is causing which. The Big Five also has prospective validity in that it predicts future behaviors pretty well. So here's a test. I encourage you to go take it. Now, let's pause and take a look at neuroticism, which is um, sometimes called emotional stability. Well, it's, you know, when, if you reverse it. Neuroticism is the likelihood and frequency of experiencing negative emotions such as irritability, anger, anxiety, hostility, etc. So this is the component that overlaps with the type A that we were talking about earlier. And neuroticism does have meaningful associations with both mental and physical health. One problem which you may have spotted already here is that if we use anxiety to construct what neuroticism means, and then we use it to predict anxiety as an outcome, we have a tautology, we have circular reasoning. So that has been part of the challenge in this area as well. Good call if you spotted that. Okay, so how might neuroticism lead to physical health outcomes? Well, it can cause a vicious cycle of stress and daily hassles like we talked about earlier, and it could lead to physiological reactivity like blood pressure. Let's pause and just wonder for a moment, how do you feel about the claim that some personality traits are good? You know, conscientiousness is associated with earning more money and having a higher education and getting things done, and some are bad. Neuroticism is associated with negative health outcomes. It's a challenge for us when we discover things that might be threatening to our view of the world as fair or as um, built in the way that we thought that it was built. 
Uh, and, and yet, the evidence is what it is. And to lighten things up a little bit, I just want to show you a picture of me. I'm on the left here with my older brother on the right. And, uh, and this is Halloween, you know, some amount of years ago. And I think it's hilarious that uh, we're sort of wearing our, our uh, we're wearing characters that seem to have played out in real life to some extent. If a capacitor is a type of battery on a uh, circuit board, and I just want to point your attention to his right sock, which is very true to how it would be constructed on the circuit board. Nice attention to detail. You can tell he's high in conscientiousness. So I said that personality traits were stable over time, and they are mostly, but it's also true that they change over time. They change within individuals, and they change across ages in a population. So, you know, imagine for a second the likelihood that you want to experience really new things. Is that going to be higher at certain ages than others? And we look here in the lower right and we see that people who are very young, you know, who are 12, are fairly disinterested in super new experiences. And then there's a middle uh, of life period where you're more interested. And then as you grow older, maybe you grow a little more into your routine. There's some good news uh, here in the lower left, which is uh, neuroticism decreases over the lifespan. Emotional stability goes up. And there's a link in the lower left if you want more on that. Let's talk now about within or between subjects differences because this is a design characteristic that really changes how we should be interpreting studies but we're often ignoring which type it is okay psychologists are often studying differences between people you know are the people who are very hostile more likely to x than people who are not hostile and we might ask other questions like are child abuse victims more likely to express psychopathology in adulthood or are people with warm and supportive relationships with their parents more likely to be seen as good friends by their peers? Do violent video games cause aggressive behavior? These are the kinds of questions that lead to designs where you measure differences between people. But there's a problem. The first issue is it's not adequate to just study people who play violent video games and then see how aggressive they are. Think back to the chicken soup. It's the same problem. You can't assume from just one column that video games are associated with anything, let alone causing it. You need the other column because the counterfactual or the comparison is what allows you to look at the separate independent influence potential of playing video games. Okay, this is called nomothetic or between persons research, also called between subjects. And we make comparisons between different people. The second problem is that we often assume that whatever effect, let's say that uh, there was an effect of video games, we often assume the effect is also true within individuals. If you found across a population that people who played more violent video games were more aggressive, you might think, oh, my child shouldn't play vital violent video games. But actually, we haven't seen any evidence that it could change within people. So assuming that between subjects designs can speak to within subjects treatments. Does it make sense? You might feel in your mind, maybe. From the perspective of statisticians and logicians, does it work? No, it doesn't work. This is the ecological fallacy. You can't make inferences about individuals just based on aggregate statistics about groups because we haven't learned anything um, we haven't learned anything at the level of the individual about the influence of that factor. So I want to show you one example of how this might show up in the data. We have aggressive behavior on the y-axis and violent video game playing on the uh, x-axis. Did I say that backwards? Aggressive behavior on the y-axis. And let's say we have uh, these four groups and we see an overall effect, right? We say, oh, wow, look, the more violent video game playing, the more aggressive behavior. And that might be because if we looked at little individuals at different levels that, you know, we're always seeing the same trend line. But 
It could also be that within each group, you know, if you took only the people who are low violent video game playing and looked at them, within that population, there's no effect. So you might be having a different trend line than across these different groups. And it could even have the reverse relationship. This is a rare pattern, but if you look only at the overall trend line, that can obscure the fact that uh, there might even be reverse effects in that population. Or it could be all over the place. So the alternative is doing ideographic or what's called within persons, within subjects of re uh, research. And the reason to care about this is if, let's say if the relationship, if, if, it, if how aggressive your kids are has no relationship with how much violent video games they play, even though across the population, the kids that are playing more violent video games are more aggressive, then do you still care about video games? And I mean, probably not. So to share with you some of the within people methods, you can do daily diaries where you're writing down your experience, experience sampling, momentary ecological assessment, which is where, you know, you might wear a device that just records different sounds. Every, every hour, it'll just record a few seconds of sound in your life, something like that. But the key, the shared component between all these methods is measuring psychological and contextual variables within one person over time and seeing how they change. The takeaway message from this section about between and within is to notice the type of evidence and when between is used to argue within or vice versa, which causes the ecological fallacy. Here is a headline from the well-respected BBC. It says, half a glass of wine every day increases breast cancer risk. You might be able to look at this headline and think, okay, well, is this, is this causal evidence? Did they do an experiment where they randomized people to drink half? No, they definitely didn't do that. Okay, so it's cross-sectional design. It might be prospective, but it might not be. Not great causal evidence. But now you also have the tool to say, is this a between subjects comparison? That is to say, the people who are drinking half a glass of wine every day have more breast cancer. But does that mean that within an individual, if you were to drink more wine, you have more breast cancer? Not necessarily, especially not if the causal story is false to begin with. So there's another tool for your back. In the next section, we're going to turn towards talking about how personality relates to conservation behaviors and sustainable outcomes. So. We might start by observing that households waste a lot of energy and uh, practical reduction if using, you know, not new crazy space tools, but just normal stuff like weatherizing your house, sealing drafts, improving the uh, efficiency of a furnace, that sort of thing, uh, can reduce household greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. So there, there's a need for people to do something, which people are doing it. And if you look at previous research, previous to me getting into this too, it looks like there are three of the big five that are predictive of doing more pro-environmental behaviors. And so when I got into this research area, I formed the hypothesis that these three variables were going to independently, positively be associated with pro-environmental behavior, especially openness. Okay, so well, let's pause on openness for a second, especially openness because, you know, it, it's associated with flexible uh, enjoyment of thinking hard and also the ability to think about long term and complex consequences. And so that seems like the kind of thinking that could be most associated with understanding and, uh, and reacting to climate change. So one of the problems with previous work in this area was that the behavior measures were kind of strange. So I constructed a new one and I looked at all kinds of different uh, behaviors that are associated with greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see they differ transportation choices and uh, water usage in the house and all sorts of things. And we hypothesized that openness would uniquely predict emissions reducing behavior, pro-environmental behavior. This project was done with Gary Lewis, uh, who is a psychologist at London. 
And I want to show you the results of the regression we ran and the covariates here. You can see there's a bunch of demographics and the reason to covary them out, assuming they were measured well, is that we can show that any result isn't because of these factors. So if you might say, ah, it's just because the hippies are, uh, you know, politically left wing, not that uh, it has anything to do with their personality. We covariate out political orientation. So uh, to the extent that that works and it's a controversial statistical claim, but then we can say that the effects of personality are independent. Here are the results of the main regression. And you can see the beta of 0.23 means that for every one unit increase in openness, uh, we have a 0.23 increase in the frequency of those behaviors for on a one to five scale from never to always. That's a pretty big effect and it was significant here. We also found the other true hypothesized traits had unique um, and positive prediction of those behaviors. Now, this, uh, these behaviors are measured with self-report, which is not the best. Of course, we don't remember our own behavior perfectly. And even if we did remember it perfectly, we might not report it perfectly because some behaviors have moral or social status concerns. Like, let's say you took an hour long shower every day. You might not be ready to say that on a survey because you know that other people. So we've looked at health. We've looked at popular personality measures like the Myers-Briggs, although it's quite flawed. We've looked at pro-environmental behavior, and now you have enough tools to look at a more controversial topic, intelligence. Uh, you know, talk to someone, stand up, stretch, pause the video. You can also ask someone uh, what they think about this question, or you can consider it for yourself. Think of someone you know that is intelligent. What about their thoughts or behaviors is intelligent? Next question, could you increase intelligence by studying and working hard? And our last thought question is, when we call someone stupid, do we mean the opposite of intelligence or something else? These are designed to help you reflect on the popular meanings of what, what we might be saying with common language, which can differ from what psychologists mean when they use similar labels. So of course, whether people are smart or not, broadly speaking, has been of interest for a long time. But the first empirical people to study it was in the early 20th century, especially Spearman. And what he did that was different was he measured performance on a wide variety of tasks that don't seem to have anything to do with each other. And what he found is that people who score highly on one type of item, let's say, I don't know, musical ability, tend to score highly on other items like manual dexterity. And that's not, um, that's not immediately obvious. And he developed uh, and used factor analysis to try and distinguish how many things are there. And he found one and he called it G for general intelligence. So, what he found was famously described as a positive manifold, and I've drawn it for you there in red at the bottom. It just means that when you correlate all the tests, let's say five tests, with all the other tests, what you find is positive, consistent associations, everything with everything. And he called that the positive manifold, and he labeled it a single factor, G. Later on, another really influential theory is that G has multiple components. Uh, and I think, uh, well, we'll return to that. Cattell observed that there seems to be a big difference between fluid intelligence, which we could think of as processing information quickly and accurately, especially novel or complex information like reasoning or analogies. And it seems to be somewhat independent of education, which is interesting and crystallized intelligence, which is knowledge acquired through experience, so like vocabulary and general knowledge. And this one is more culture-based and it's more um, affected by whether you went to school and those sorts of things. And if you ask yourself a question like, well, can I get smarter over my lifetime? It depends on what you mean by smart because 
Fluid intelligence goes down over the lifespan. We just get a little bit slower at processing information, novel information, accurately and quickly. But crystallized intelligence can increase across the lifespan, shown here in sort of lime green. So we have to distinguish between the two if we want to talk about whether people are smart. And you can also imagine that crystallized intelligence is something that is also associated with wisdom. Uh, we might say the thing that we're interested in when we say that old people have wisdom is that they have a breadth of experience which they can draw upon when making inferences. And that's not really the same thing as saying if you showed them a word puzzle, they could solve it quickly. It's, it's interesting to observe that if you have a very high crystallized intelligence, you can sometimes operate quickly and accurately more than people who are younger because you've seen a situation like that before. You can process the most inform you can pay attention to the most important information and react to it, not get distracted. So it's not uh, that we are gonna forget everything as we get older, it's quite a bit more complicated. Now, I promised you earlier that I would tell you about why intelligence matters or why we would want to measure G in the way that we measure neuroticism or openness. One of the things is that fluid intelligence, even at a young age, predicts educational outcomes. That's not immediately obvious. You might expect that educational outcomes are the result of hard work, ethic drilled in by your parents and those sorts of things. And I'm not saying that can't have an influence, but just the ability to process information accurately and quickly is predictive of doing well in school. And you can, you can observe that sort of effect by looking at these uh, latent variables here in the middle, which are labeled F1 and F2. So on the left, you take uh, performance in all kinds of different uh, classes and they correlate with each other because people who are good at school in general are just good at school. And then we call that academic performance in F2. And on the right, we take, you know, uh, later exit exams for university and we correlate those into just, ex you know, uh, some exam performance and we look at the correlation between them. And 0.81 is quite a strong correlation. So there seems to be something really linked about these. G also predicts job success. It's been studied for such a long time that we actually have data across entire lifespans of people and, and that can help you do a lot of interesting uh, comparisons. Here is a typology of separating people into different cognitive ability levels and then seeing just how much money they earn per week. And the data is out of date. It doesn't matter how much money it is. The point is the slope, that with cognitive ability comes increased wages. And we all want to earn more money, right? So that makes us care a little bit about what is this thing. Separate from education and income, it turns out that G also predicts political attitudes. This is quite a complicated graph, but let me just highlight on the left we have G, and it's a latent variable, which is shown by a circle, and it's being constructed by these uh, boxes on the top left, which are boxes because they're measured variables. And the arrows point from G to the boxes because the model is assuming that G is causing them, that there's some underlying quality called general intelligence, which is causing each of those outcomes. Okay, that's how it's being modeled. And then you can see that G is relating to educational outcomes, and social class outcomes, and the latent variable over here on the right, which we can call social and political attitudes. And that one is driving, you can see, attitudes about women, uh, social left-wingism, anti-racism, uh, and political trust. It's not immediately obvious that how quickly and accurately people can operate on novel information would be associated with whether they support women in the workplace. But it turns out they, they are related and positively. Finally, and there is just an, a whole field of results here, but I'm giving you some highlights. High fluid intelligence leads to less religiosity, which is the 
uh, not you know what religion people belong to, but how intensely they engage with their religion. And here are some different uh, regressions that are partialing out different components of religiosity that might be of interest to you. So you can look at mindfulness and spirituality, private practice of religion, religious support, religious identification, etc. And you can see the row there called IQ shows that it has relationship to some of these, but not other ones. And you can look around at age, sex, and education too, if you're interested. Oh, here uh, is openness to experience, which you can see has some substantial relationships as well. So next time you want to know why your uncle is so religious, take a look at this graph. Okay, what outcome in life could be more important than when you're going to die? And it turns out that G also predicts mortality. A one standard uh, deviation advantage, which in the norm IQ would be 15 points, is associated with a, uh, a quarter less risk of death from, uh, in adults. One thing that might be surprising is that childhood socioeconomic status, that is the you know, the education level of your parents and the income of your household when you were a child does not impact the relationship between intelligence and mortality. That is to say, even if you're born into a very high socioeconomic status household, uh, if you are low fluid intelligence, then you're still at higher risk of death. And the reverse is also true. If you're born into a low SES household, um, and you're very, very good at processing information quickly and accurately, then you're going to be less likely to die early. Now, controlling for adult socioeconomic status and education does reduce the relationship. And that means that it's not that context doesn't matter at all. It does matter. But childhood SDS doesn't seem to matter here. In the last part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about pro-sociality. And this is, uh, this is a big word, and I mean that it has a lot of content. And uh, let's just distinguish right now between traits, which are features of the individual. We've been talking about personality traits like agreeableness. Uh, honesty, humility is one that uh, I haven't talked about a lot, but it's part of the Hexaco model instead of the big five. But prosociality also refers to behaviors like sharing, cooperating, and such. Broadly speaking, when I say this term, I mean benefiting others, and especially at personal cost. And it turns out, and the reading for today goes into this, if you were to distill this down to a single kind of concept, it's, it's really the opposite of exploitation. Certain situations and certain personality traits tend to make it more or less likely that we exploit others. I want to give you the sort of zoomed out view first, which is that people are not as selfish as we originally expected. You know, the philosophy in early modern Europe, um, for example, was sort of trying to get between, you know, are people naturally good, like, um, the kind of Rousseau um, perspective, or are they a blank slate? That's more Locke's perspective. And then, and then it went to sort of uh, the more Hobbesian notion that people are, are brutal, and that's our natural state. We've, uh, we've moved on from these to uh, the better understanding that uh, people are deeply influenced by their context and also by their genes. Um, but one of the key findings here is that people are not as selfish as expected. And this has been part of the impetus for the huge and growing field of behavioral economics. Um, economics now healthily recognizes that people do things uh, um, more than just their sort of immediate uh, advancement in units such as money. Utility to people also includes, um, yeah, these feelings of being a good person and also the sense of contributing and feelings of meaning and satisfaction. It's also important to, to reflect that, you know, the 60s and 70s were beset by problems where people were trying to predict 
uh, behavior from personality and it turned out kind of difficult to find meaningful relationships there even though personality was clearly reliable, identifiable, important and one of the big resolutions of that was to notice that personality matters but it's most predictive. You'll see the biggest associations with people doing the same sort of thing uh, in that same situation over time. So if you're a generous person, you might reliably uh, do some generous thing at home, like, uh, you know, do the dishes. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you will be a generous person in all the other contexts. You might have a context in your life, like, I don't know, parking your bike in front of someone else's door that you also do every day. And just because you are a higher than average generous person, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't do this other behavior as well. So personality matters, but it's more predictive when you include context. So consistency within context, within individuals of that type, more than across situations. We did some work uh, related to this actually, which in which we asked people how much they would estimate that others would do certain pro-social things as a function of them being incentivized or not. So in the first study, um, we asked about blood donation, like how many people would donate blood if they were paid 15 euros? Just guess, what's the percentage of the population in the Netherlands you think that would? And then we also asked, well, how many people would do it if they were volunteering for free? And then we took uh, other samples of people, partially overlapping, and it, it's a little complicated, the design, but then we took other samples of people, and sometimes the same people, and we asked them whether they would do those things. And this allowed us to then compare with the estimations of what people would do based on self-interest with what they actually did. And to make a long story short um, of this paper, which has come out in 2021, you can see here that in two different samples of participants, we show a robust overestimation. That is that people were overestimating self-interest in others. The payment and in the other study, uh, smoking status and, and their impressions on smoking policies, those individual uh, sort of benefits to that person making a decision were less important than others expected. So this is an interesting piece of evidence that we still have this impression that others are more motivated by selfish goals than, than they might actually be. I think that leads into our reading for today nicely, the personality and pro-social behavior piece, which you may have noticed was written um, uh, in large part here in Amsterdam by some colleagues at the VU. So this is a long and complex paper, but uh, you don't need to know all the technical detail. I'm going to mention some of the highlights here in lecture and give you a sense of what kind of information I want you to take out of it. What they did is they did a, a big meta-analysis of all kinds of studies using incentivized uh, games, public goods games, etc. And they tried to answer what the relationship was between personality and all kinds of pro-social behaviors. So in lecture today, I've mostly been talking about results that are about a specific behavior, and that's fine, but um, this is about a really broad range of behaviors, and this is the kind of evidence that would lead us to have more confidence that there's some relationship between personality and a class of behaviors, like being helpful to others. And what is a meta-analysis? Maybe you've learned before, but it's a it's basically a formal combination of different studies that takes into account the structure, features of those studies, their outcomes, their predictors. And it also takes into account how many observations go into each study, and it makes a quantitative combination of those effect sizes to have some sort of distilled overall summary. This is a very powerful approach, um, particularly when you analyze a lot of studies, and they analyzed almost 800. So this is, a, this is a profound contribution, and, uh, and we have to take their findings more seriously than if they were just presenting a single online survey, for example. In Table 1, they present a bunch of economic game paradigms, 
And I think one of the nice takeaways from this paper is what are the kind of paradigms used to study prosocial behavior in different kinds of um, different kinds of studies. And I like also that they've included the real life examples here. So this could be part of an exam question. For example, we might ask about a certain structure of game or uh, ask to connect from the real life back to the game or from the game to real life. This is one of the main uh, outcomes, and you can see this in figure four. It's pretty small in the slide, so feel free to pull up the reading. But this is how results from meta-analyses are frequently graphed. What you see is on the x-axis is the meta-analytic meta correlation, and then, so that's, you know, is it positively or negatively related or just about at zero? And, um, and then you have the different types of traits here in rows. So to look right at the top, we have social value orientation. There were a lot of studies that included that, and it had a massive positive correlation on prosocial behavior across all kinds of games. So if you had one variable to measure for whether people would, uh, you know, take advantage of others in, in incentivized games, that sounds like a great variable to measure. I also want to direct your attention to the fourth item on the list, pro-environmentalism, which is also quite positive, although you can see there's fewer studies, so the um, error bars are wider because the, um, the measurement is less precise because we don't have as many observations. That's interesting, um, you know, that pro-environmentalism is associated with all kinds of pro-social behavior, not just related to environmental outcomes. That's not immediately obvious. You know, you might think that environmentalists are uh, just concerned with environment in the same way that, you know, I don't know if you're a human rights campaigner or something, you, that might be your issue. Or if you support a certain specific vulnerable group, that might be your issue. You might not be that engaged on other topics. But it turns out environmentalism might be different. And I think that one of the reasons might be related to logic we gave in that Brick and Lewis uh, unearthing the green personality paper earlier, which is that environmentalism requires a certain kind of very long distance, very long term, abstract concern about harms that are very much not happening to you personally. And that finding is consistent with a recent result from my work as well. So lead author here, uh, Stepan Vesely, ran an incentivized experiment and tested expectations of others' behaviors. And as we predicted, environmentalists were perceived as more cooperative in the social dilemma setting. They were sought after more as cooperation partners, and other people cooperated more when they were paired with them. So maybe environmental behaviors signal a real cooperative disposition in general and others can act on this uh, signal in situations with real consequences. So an implication of these results is that being seen as an environmentalist confers personal benefits to environmentalists because others are more willing to cooperate with them and to establish interactions with them, as well as the benefits it offers to society and the environment in general. This might be part of why lots of people say they're green or, or represent themselves as environmentalists, whether or not their actions are particularly green. So that's been the lecture for today, and here are the learning goals for you to look over again to see what you got out and to look at your um, notes and uh, to help you study for the exam. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon.